Um, so, uh, my name is Mitchell Dunko. I'm giving a presentation on the future is now. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be talking about something. I'm going to get to it in a second. But it's about how our lives are going to radically change uh, in a way that no other human's lives have ever changed in 100,000 years of our history. So before I told you that, though, would anyone have said in our lifetime that our lives are going to be fundamentally different than any other human life in the past? Maybe, maybe raise their hand. Up. No? Okay, probably. Yeah? Yeah, okay. Like, fundamentally, like in ways that we can't even imagine. I'm going to explain. So in our lifetime, we're approaching uh, developments in technology and genetics in, a way that we, in ways that humanity has never even come close to before. Um, and as we grow closer in understanding both of these fields, that's going to lead to something called singularity. Has anyone ever heard of singularity before? All right, can I see a show of hands? Do you guys want to explain it really quick? Or you guys. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, the, it's the point at which machines and humans are kind of indistinguishable from each other. Is that yes, no, it's, it's really close. So, um, singularity is there we go. the emergence of greater than human intelligence through technological means. And when you think of that, you think of like, yeah, I mean, this is crazy, right? You think of like Battlestar Galactica if you're a huge nerd like me, or you think of like, you know, cyborgs, right? Um, but this is actually. As you look at the, the progress of technology and genetics, this is actually going to be possible in our lifetime. Which I know it sounds unreasonable, but just bear with me for a little bit. And I'm trying to persuade you that not only is this going to happen, um, and it's going to happen in our lifetime, but that we have to start thinking about it. And I don't want to use the word preparing, as in like this is an ap apocalyptic future. But we have to start thinking about how we're going to handle it, um, and, and what laws and regulations and norms are we going to adopt for it. Because I promise you, it's coming. Um, so how can you trust me, right? I mean, I'm a 21-year-old, uh, I'm 22 actually, I'm 22, <laughs> I study plague, I go to American University, you know, what do I know? Um, I think the reason why I got interested in this topic stems largely from my family. Um, this is a picture of my family uh, after we ran a half marathon together down in uh, Manorain, California. Uh, we, we ran a half marathon, that was our first one. And I, I'm just gonna say off the bat, I'm the dumb one of the family. Um, <clears throat> This is my brother, Todd. He's getting his PhD at Berkeley right now in biotechnology. He already has a couple patents, and he goes around the country and presents papers, and the, and the world, actually. He's, he also, I make fun of him because he looks like Jesus. He doesn't shave, whatever. Uh, this is Scott. Uh, he graduated from Chicago. He's a uh, pretty smart guy. Um, he was student body president there. He um, did chemistry and political science. And now he is, he's created his own database system, which he sells to politicians and political campaigns. Uh, he does their web stuff. Even though he didn't learn it in college, he just sort of taught it himself. This is my sister, Janessa. She's going to be at Yale this summer doing soil research. And these are my parents. They're both engineers. Uh, my dad is a uh, distinguished strategist, is what it's called, at HP. Um, and he just gave a talk to all of Shell's uh, R&D department, research and development, basically talking about the future of technology. So while I am not very good at all these things, I grew up around the dinner table talking about science, about engineering, and politics. And I, I went more towards the politics route. A lot of my family went more towards the science route. And my mom, she's smarter than ever. She was an engineer also. Um, so more than just my family, though, um, I want to talk about the really the leading figure in uh, Singularity, and that's Ray Kurzweil. Um, he's got 19 honorary doctorates, 39 patents, author of seven books. And really, this term singularity was coined by his book in 2005, um, which came out and presented a you know, significant amount of evidence about why this is going to happen. Um, he got really famous in high school. He, he uh, was on this game show, and it was like one of those things where they say, you know, what's you have, he, he played a bit of music, and they asked him, you know, what's so special about this, and the panelists had to try to figure it out. Well, in 1965, he had designed a program, a computer program. Um, it wasn't like a computer where we think of it was like really old school. Uh, that actually wrote that music. And he was, in, he was 17 at the time. He went on to MIT. He's been all over the world doing his stuff. Um, in February 21st, 2011, this was the cover of uh, Time Magazine. And it was talking about the singularity, which uh, Mr. Kurzweil believes is going to happen in the year 2045. He, he predicts this is when singularity is going to occur. Um, but beyond just, you know, this, this isn't just some sort of uh, cult-like following of one forward thinker. This is bigger than that. And there's a number of other people and institutes working in singularity. So it's not sort of like this is his, you know, Mr. Kurzweil's um, kind of like crazy idea. This is actually something that people are really seriously talking about in the scientific community. Um, you got people from Oxford University, from St. John's College, from Cambridge, 
um, all over the country. Bill Gates uh, calls Mr. Kurzweil uh, the best predictor of future technology, better than anyone I know. This wasn't verbatim, but it was something along those lines. Um, the CEO of PayPal is involved. Now there's a couple institutes getting involved. This is a Sens Foundation, which does uh, human uh, regenerative engineering. Um, so what that means, you know, talking about like cyborg and, and the implications for that. Uh, if you think about your body as a machine, and the reason why we die, it's not because someone stops a clock watch and says, now it's your turn to die, at least that's not what you can empirically prove. What we can prove is that the body gets worn down as it gets older, right? Just like any machine. And if you are somehow regenerative, you can fix the things that get worn down, you can live longer. So death isn't inevitable, but it's a construct of our physical being, of, our, of the machine that makes it work. Um, so that's what he's looking into, is how can you regenerate genes so that we stay alive? He's already done some really cool things. And that's uh, Aubrey de Grey is the head of that institute. Singularity Institute uh, was started by Mr. Carswell, but it's, it's run by several other people now. Um, and it has a massive conference every year where you get all kinds of huge main people talking about the implications of singularity. Um, but more than just, you know, the, I don't expect you guys to believe in it because, you know, scientists and experts believe in it. I want to show you the facts about why I think this is a pretty, there's a pretty persuasive case for why singularity is going to happen and why we need to start thinking about it. Um, and the first thing that I want to just present is this theory developed by somebody like Edward Moore in 1965. Does anyone heard of it? Yeah? I, I took a class in this subject okay. last semester. You don't have to. All right. <laughs> so basically, um, he said in 1965, way along ago, I mean, way ahead of the game, he, he predicted that transistors on a microchip, so how like a computer functions, would double every year as we as uh, every, excuse me, double every two years. So technology essentially is gonna double every two years. And as we look at it, um, and of course if it's doubling every two years, what that creates is uh, an exponential curve. That's sort of what we have going here. Um, it's, it's not a linear line, it's that every two years technology is gonna double. Um, and Mr. Kurzweil, what he took with this, he said, okay, that's, you know, that's totally fascinating. I wonder if it applies to anything else. So he looked at uh, computing power you can purchase for $1,000, check. Mostly doubles every two years. The falling cost of manufacturing transistors, check. Uh, the, risking, the rising clock speed of microprocessors, check. Uh, the plummeting price of, of RAM, check. The falling cost of sequencing D DNA, excuse me, check. Wireless data service, the rising number of internet hosts, and nanotechnology patents. All of these things more or less double every two years. Um, so that's where he bases his predictions about the future. Um, and that's where he came up with this. Um, so this is his sort of chart, uh, and his, his chart about where technology has been, and by extension, where it's going. Um, so starting in 1900, although there's also charts that go back to the beginning of life, although I think those are a lot more suspect because there's a lot less data. Um, this is sort of that exponential curve Actually, this isn't a proper drawing because it doubles every two years, so that was slightly worse. Um, <clears throat> this is where we've been from 1900 uh, to 2012. He predicts that in 2016 we'll be able to have the computing uh, power to map and recreate an insect's brain. By 2022, it's going to be that of a mouse. Uh, by 2045, he predicts we're going to be able to recreate a human. Um, and Futurists and singularity uh, experts, they don't, they're very careful not to predict exactly what's going to happen because in the next 30 years, especially with technology doubling every two years, it's very uncertain about where we're going to go. Um, and that's why there's sort of some differences of agreement, excuse me, differences of opinion about uh, the implications. As I brought up earlier, um, these are really the three ones that people are mostly talking about. Artificial intelligence, you might think of like Terminator. Uh, you know, that's, that's one like sort of scary thought about artificial intelligence. Um, so human biological enhancement, as I mentioned earlier, like cyborgs, right? I mean, think about it. <clears throat> you have a cell phone right now that you can call and do all kinds of different things on. Well, why not just have it in your head, right? I mean, that's sort of the next step. Once we figure out how the brain works, why do we have to put it up against our ear when we can just put it inside of our head? Um, or brain-computer inter interfaces. And this is the idea of if we can somehow understand the consciousness of our brain, we can plug it into a computer. Uh, and from there uh, live indefinitely as conscious organisms, which is like kind of cool to think about, or freaky. Um, 
So the critics generally say that uh, Mr. Kurzweil and anyone who believes in singularity don't understand the human brain, and we're just not going to get there. Um, a lot of people talk about the, ninth, excuse me, the 20th century as being the century that we started to understand computers, the internet. That was the, the big thing that happened, at least towards the end. Uh, the 21st century is going to be the century that we unlock the brain. Um, and then the second thing they say is that this exponential growth rate of technology uh, isn't going to extend indefinitely. But what they both don't do is say that singularity will not be. They both say that singularity will be reached. They don't doubt it. it's going to get there. Um, so I, I'm not going to speculate too much about whether or not we're going to unlock the brain, or whether or not this is you know we're going to this technology is going to extend indefinitely. Um, I think that based on the predictions, I think that there's reliable evidence to indicate that it will. But I mean, you can't be sure. Um, but certainly, we're going to get there someday. And so, what I think this means for us <clears throat> is that we need to start figuring out. Not only for ourselves right now, and, and you know, we've created social organizations like the U.S. where you have the liberty to think about, you know, self and life and death. And usually, you can be, you know, it doesn't really bother somebody else because if you die or they die, it doesn't matter if they think they're going to heaven or if they, they think they're just going to cease to exist because it doesn't really affect us. But when we can start living indefinitely, it's going to start to affect affect us. And so we have to start tackling these issues as a society. And so, especially in the university room and many of us are going to go on to policy positions, we have to start thinking about this a little bit. Um, the next thing is that we can't fight singularity. Uh, we can only ensure that it's as safe as possible. Um, if there's one thing that is absolutely certain about humanity, it's that any time we had an opportunity to explore, even if it's pushed back a little bit initially, we do explore. Um, and so instead of pushing <coughs> singularity research uh, into sort of like the basements, I guess you could say, or behind closed doors, it's much better to do it and the transparency uh, and openness of academia, where we can make sure that we start thinking about <clears throat> how are we going to prepare for it, um, and, and what we can do to make sure that if we do create artificial intelligence, it has a code of ethics that is favorable towards humans, and things like that. So anyway, um, I hope <clears throat> you gather from this presentation that singularity is imminent, uh, and that we have to start thinking about it uh, as policymakers and as citizens. Thank you very much.